Anyway, your midterm is Thursday. You um, you can use anything you want except for Google. Uh, so you can you can use your notes, the homework solutions, all that stuff. Just don't Google things um, or any use any other search engine. <laughs> but um, uh, and we'll you know we'll be an hour and fifteen minutes and just you know basically study all that homework and the homework solutions. I did give you a homework problem last Thursday. I'm going to give you one more today, and those are eligible for the exam, but I will be posting the solutions to that homework tomorrow. So you can try and kind of get your feet wet with them, and then you can look at the solutions tomorrow. But those are candidates for the uh, exam on Thursday. And any questions before we... Yes? And what's the format for the exam? The format for the exam is basically seven questions because there's seven homework assignments, one from each. That's basically my approach. Um, and there'll be questions a little bit more challenging than the quiz questions I've given you, but not that much more challenging. So, well, no, I mean, they're less challenging because you have all the solutions to study from versus working the homework and hoping to God you got it right and then coming in and taking a quiz over it. So that's the difference. Other questions? All right. Oh yeah, no, I, I don't think that's going to happen this time. But let's, let's hope. Let's hope. So is the final or final midterm going to be in class or take home? Oh, in class. Okay. Yeah, it's an in class. The final will be take home, but gotcha. the midterm is in class. Yeah. Other questions? Comments? Observations? Okay, let's do this. All right, so last time we got our hands dirty with some equations and stuff to kind of get you introduced to the Higgs mechanism. Today we're going to make that picture way more clear using pictures. <laughs> Dang, it's convenient. Okay, so um, I'm going to start by focusing on the notion of a broken symmetry, because this plays a role. Um, it obviously plays a role in the Higgs mechanism, because one thing that no one observed last time, I'll fault you for that, is that for the Higgs story, we started out with this symmetry. And because we had this symmetry, the mass of the gauge bosons had to be zero. That's the standard argument. And then the Higgs mechanism came along and it did its thing with this non-trivial solution and all of a sudden it was giving the gauge bosons mass. So the question is, what the hell happened to the symmetry? Is the symmetry still there? Is it not there? What's, what's going on? Okay, so we're gonna start with a discussion of broken symmetry and then we'll roll this back into the um, Higgs mechanism story in just a minute. So in terms of a broken symmetry, uh, and this is technically the term broken symmetry. All right. Um, the question I might ask is, is it possible, I think this is L, is it possible for a solution to the equations of motion not to exhibit the symmetry of the underlying Lagrangian. So remember, the way we do mechanics generally is we start with a Lagrangian, and then we do a variation of the Lagrangian being zero, gives rise to the equations of motion. So we have been sitting here building Lagrangians, saying they have a symmetry, that we localize it, but we, we really specify these Lagrangians have symmetries. So my question is, if a Lagrangian has a symmetry, do the equations of motion have a symmetry? And moreover, do the solutions of the equations of motion have the symmetry? And the answer we can immediately find from a simple example is that no, the equations of motion do not have to have solutions which share the symmetry of the original Lagrangian. Let me give you a really, really quick and simple example of that. And this actually plays an important role in the Higgs story. So imagine, oh wow, is this one out? Oops. Okay, I got three new ones. So I think those are the old ones. Maybe this one is new. And maybe 
again, just waiting too long with the ink set up. Uh, okay, so, oh yeah, that's stupid. Oh yeah, oh, so sweet. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna consider a theory with some potential. Okay, and it's a field theory, so the field value is phi, and then the potential depends on phi. And the Lagrangian, we can imagine, if this is a scalar field, we can imagine its kinetic term looks like that, and we'll take it to be a massless thing for now. Um, and then we have minus the potential term. Okay, so this is the sort of standard Lagrangian approach. And now what I wanna do is I wanna say, okay, suppose that the potential actually looked like this. Now, um, suppose that the potential was actually given by minus one half phi squared plus one quarter phi to the fourth. Okay, that generates this shape. Now, I want you to notice this thing, and consequently this thing, is symmetric under phi goes to minus phi. If you take this and you send phi to minus phi, it just flips it around the vertical axis, but it looks the same. That's a symmetry, right? Everybody agree? Okay, well, let's take this and let's find the equations of motion. So we know what this looks like. dl d phi minus d mu dl d oh, d mu phi this ends up being minus dv d phi minus one half d mu d mu phi equals zero. Okay. Now, um, as we talked about last time, one way to find solutions is just to say I want it to be uniform, so the kinetic term is zero. The field phi is not changing as you go around. Okay. So we can find solutions. d mu phi equals zero form. And, uh, well, that means that the dv d phi has to be zero, okay? So dv d phi is, of course, minus phi plus phi cubed. Has to be zero. And this will give us at least three different solutions. Zero, plus one, and minus one. You could have looked at the picture and gotten that, right? You want the derivative of v with respect to phi to be zero. It's here, here, and there, okay? So we have the zero solution, the plus one solution, the minus one solution. Make sense? Okay, Cameron. <laughs> Had a mask on. <laughs> All right, Cameron. Is the solution zero symmetric under the exchange of phi to minus phi? Yes, good. Sergio, are you here, Sergio? I don't see Sergio. He might be late. Sean, is plus one symmetric under phi goes to minus phi? Yes. No. <laughs> I mean, is phi equals plus one the same if you send phi to minus phi? Is phi equals plus one the same as if I send phi to minus phi? No, it becomes minus one. Yeah, yeah I mean, we're, we're interchanging one and minus one, and therefore minus one is not symmetric either. Okay, zero is the same if you send phi to minus phi. Zero is the same. Okay, let me actually expand on that to make this point. So remember, what we do is we take the solution to the classical equations of motion. That constitutes our background. And then what we want to do is we want to study fluctuations about that solution, okay? So what we normally, and we did this last time, but we're gonna take phi of x to be phi naught, which is the uh, solution to these classical equations of motion, and then we want to uh, allow fluctuations. Okay, these are the small degrees of freedom which in quantum field theory represent particles. Okay, um, 
Um, so we just stick this back into the Lagrangian, and what we find is L of delta phi is d mu phi naught plus delta phi, and I'm not going to write delta phi of x, but these depend on position. Yes? Is it just a coincidence that the minus 1 and plus 1 both happen to be solutions? They're just different solutions? Or do you always get that? Do you get sort of a mirror form of it with the other part of the symmetry? Well, that the fact that there exists this pair of solutions which transform into each other is a reflection of the fact that there was this interchange symmetry in the Lagrangian. Okay, but let me finish what I'm writing and you'll understand that the behavior of those two things is different, okay? So let me just, let me finish writing this. Um, and then we have d mu phi naught plus delta phi minus phi naught plus delta phi squared plus phi naught plus delta phi to the fourth. And then if you multiply all this out, cancel. Oh, oh, so here's what we're going to do. Anytime we see a d mu phi naught in this expansion, this will be 0 because phi naught is just a constant. This is the thing that depends on position. This is just the solution. So what we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to study motion around these. these are, this is small fluctuations around these solutions. So these are fixed constant values, but the fluctuations depend on position. Okay, so expanding this out, setting all those terms to zero, we're going to be left with um, yeah, okay, so we're going to be left with d mu delta phi d mu delta phi minus phi naught plus delta phi squared plus phi naught plus delta phi to the fourth. Sorry. I don't like to erase. Okay, so if we look at what this Lagrangian looks like if we take the phi naught equals zero solution, well, that just becomes d mu delta phi, uh, d mu delta phi. And I don't know why I have two lower mu's, that was stupid. Yes? What happened to the one half and one fourth on the d squared d to the fourth term? For Sorry. Potential? Why don't you come three over uh, negative, uh, negative Oh, uh, oh yeah, you're right. Uh, I dumped those. Okay. I don't know why. That was kind of silly of me. But it's not important. Don't worry about it. Okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, and now, <laughs> you could put them back in and that would, that would make sense. But now, so this is if I'm expanding around the zero solution here. And now I'm just going to expand around the plus one. You could also figure out what it would look like if I expanded around the minus one. But anyway, this would be d mu delta phi, uh, d mu delta phi, minus, well, 1 plus delta phi squared plus 1 plus delta phi squared. Okay? Now notice, in this case, L of delta phi is the same as L of minus delta phi. That is, this Lagrangian when we're expanding around this solution, for the fluctuations, they still possess this symmetry. Uh, is this like the one plus delta phi to the fourth on the smaller term? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I don't know why I keep writing squared. It's something in my brain or something missing from my brain. I don't know. But anyway. Okay, but notice this Lagrangian does not share that property. So in this case, L of delta phi is not the same as L of minus delta phi, okay? Rather, if I send phi to delta phi, or, phi to mi or delta phi to minus delta phi, I'm interchanging L plus one 
with L minus 1. Okay? All right, now that might seem silly, but it's going to play a critical role in what we're going to talk about in a minute. But what is imperative to realize is that the full underlying potential for both of these stories is symmetric, okay? It's just that when we focus our attention on fluctuations around a solution, the fluctuations can, can be the product of a Lagrangian which does or does not share that symmetry. So again, if we take this solution, the fluctuations still preserve that phi goes to minus phi symmetry. But if we take either one of these, the single Lagrangian doesn't. Rather, you need these two Lagrangians to be interchanged. Okay? All right. Now, um, what in the hell does this have to do with the Higgs mechanism? Well, let's recall um, what we discovered for the Higgs mechanism. We found that uh, for a scalar field, assuming it was complex, that this took the form 1 half uh, d mu minus i q over h bar c, a mu phi star uh, d mu plus i q over h bar and then we had all these wonderful terms. Minus one half mu squared phi star phi plus one fourth lambda squared phi star phi is a r squared. That's to the fourth. But anyway, um, plus one over 16 phi f mu mu f mu mu. Okay? Now, um, this obviously has the uh, highly symmetric solution, which is that we take phi naught to be zero and a mu to be zero. And we talked about this last time. If I take this solution, and, and again, this is assuming these are constants, so the derivative terms vanish, et cetera, et cetera. A mu is zero, so these whole derivative terms go away, so you're just basically extremizing the potential. And phi equals zero is obviously a solution to extremizing the potential. Um, if we expand the solutions here in terms of fluctuations, so if we let phi equal phi naught plus delta phi of x and a equal a mu naught plus delta a mu of x, then if we plug these in, this just gives us back exactly the same expression. We're just replacing phi and a mu with delta phi and delta mu. It's the same as we have here, okay? If we just use phi not equal zero, then the, the Lagrangian you get is just the Lagrangian with delta phi everywhere, okay? Of course, that wasn't the more interesting situation. The more interesting situation was to use something that satisfied this certain requirement, but we could specifically say that the real part of phi is mu over lambda, and then we can take the complex part, or the imaginary part, to be zero, and then take a mu equal to zero. And then we can rename the fluctuations delta phi one is eta, delta phi two is beta, and delta a mu, we just call a mu. And then our Lagrangian, so once again, you know, if, if we're taking the derivative terms to zero, saying the, the background solutions are constant, the only thing we have to do is extremize this potential. But this potential, the extremization of it, has this as a solution, but it also has this as a solution. This is what we talked about last time. So if I take this as a solution and I expand in terms of fluctuations, which I'm just renaming eta, beta, and A, then the Lagrangian takes the form one half d mu eta d mu eta plus mu squared eta squared plus one half d mu beta d mu beta plus one over 16 pi f mu nu f mu nu plus one half q over h bar c mu over lambda Okay, plus 
across various interactions. Right. And then the important thing to observe is that even though we started out with this thing, which had a massless A field, a massless phi field, except for this weird term, but that's not technically a mass, it's tachyonic, if anything. When we took this background solution and then we expanded in fluctuations, the fluctuations take the form of a massive scalar, a massless scalar, and a massive vector field. That's just a summary of what we talked about last time. Okay? <clears throat> this story is actually very, very similar to this story. The only difference is that this is a discrete transformation. You're basically taking this and flipping it. Not continuously rotating it, but flipping it. However, the symmetry in this case is continuous. So to really get a, go ahead. What was that last one again? Various interactions. There's, there's a bunch more terms of interactions between these different fields. These are just ba the basic kinetic terms for each of them, because I want you to identify that they're massive. And then the various interaction terms. You know, they have eta times beta times A, all that stuff. That's not that important. I mean, it is, but it isn't. <laughs> okay. So we've got, There, 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 there should be some symmetry breaking here, right? Because all of a sudden our gauge fields have mass. This is, this is not symmetric. The starting point was symmetric under these transformations. Okay? The, the, the theory of the fluctuations does not share that symmetry. That seems, and it's based on taking a non-trivial solution, that seems connected to this, right? Here, I have this underlying symmetry, but by taking a non-trivial solution, if I take a trivial solution, the symmetry is still there. If I take a non-trivial solution, however, the description of the fluctuations don't have that symmetry. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? The big problem is that this is a discrete symmetry. It's either this or this, whereas this is continuous. So we need a way to take this story and make it continuous. How are we going to do that? Give it a sombrero. Let's do it. That's why <laughs> Ross asked me if I was going to bring a sombrero to class. No, I didn't. But here we go. That would have helped my learning a lot more. Today. Say it again? That would have helped my learning a lot more. Well, I'm going to draw a sombrero, so <laughs> I just won't put stripes on it. Okay, so what we need to do, and I probably regret that I really saw this, but whatever, yeah. is we want to sombrerize this thing. Because after all, the reason why this is continuous is because phi has two components. And what I'm thinking of in terms of the transformations is just a transformation by multiplying by a phase. Well, that's a rotation. So what I can imagine is V of phi as functions of phi 1 and phi 2. And then my V of phi is going to take this form. God, I hope I can draw this right. Let me draw this in blue just so that we can annotate things. Everybody get it now? Okay, we're basically taking that discrete symmetry situation and we're rotating it around the axis. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Well, let's, let's look at some interesting stuff. So first of all, 
V of phi, which we're now going to call U of phi, because we're going to go back to our notation, was, of course, minus mu squared phi star phi plus one-fourth lambda squared phi star phi squared. Okay? That is the potential that we worked with last time. It is this shape. I just never drew it. But now we've drawn it. I know, this is intuitive. That's not intuitive. <laughs> intuitive, not. Okay, so um, remember, this is the wrong sign mass term. which we said could be tachyonic, but I said to you it would give us, we would get a completely different interpretation of it. Well, here it is. This term is associated with the fact that this is unstable. If I choose my solution as the zero point, and then I consider perturbations away from that, they're just going to roll down the hill. Does that make sense? Versus these points, where if I choose these as my starting points and then consider fluctuations, they're stable, okay? So this can be interpreted as a sign of instability. That is, it's a solution to the equations of motion, yeah, but the moment you perturb about it, your perturbations are going to run away. They're not going to just sit and oscillate. No, they're going to run downhill. Okay? That means that you could start out in this solution, but you won't stay there. You'll move to another solution. Okay? So this is obviously the phi equals zero solution. Um, if we want to explore, yeah, let me see, what do I want to do? Let's explore the solution that I did down there, phi 1 equals mu over lambda. So that's actually this solution right here, where phi 2 is 0 and phi 1 takes a value, okay, which minimizes this thing. Now, if you think about it, there you go. I drew your card. I'm going to go back and draw it again, okay? Now, remember that the fluctuations along phi 1 we called eta. Well, if you think about it, a fluctuation around this point in phi 1 is one that basically goes up and then back like that. Okay? It's basically just going back and forth on this little slope. On the other hand, for phi 2, which we took to be zero, we're sitting on the phi one axis, so the phi two value is zero. We called the fluctuations beta. In that case, the fluctuations just go back and forth without going up or down in the potential. Does everybody see that? You sure? Okay, good. Now, are you ready? This is the best part, my favorite. Looking at this and looking at that, how do you get the mass from the picture? Taylor expanding about the shape of the Well, yes, but, but basically, what do you need to consider about the shape of the potential in order it's to determine like the sign? Say it again? It's like the parabola. Well, it's the concavity. So here we have a positive concavity along phi 1, but here we have zero concavity along phi 2. Well, look at this. Phi 1 has a mass, phi 2 doesn't. Everybody see that? OK. In fact, the concavity of this was negative. That's the tachyonic part. So suddenly you should realize that if you have a potential which is graphed 
and you just consider the concavity, the fluctuations are going to have a mass which is reflective of the concavity about which they're fluctuating. If it's concave up, they're massive fluctuations. If it's flat, they're massless. If it's concave down, they're tachyonic. They have negative mass. Okay? But again, tachyonic fluctuations are not actually particles that exist that travel faster than the speed of light. Rather, they are indications that you're at an unstable solution. You won't stay there. Your fluctuations are not just going to sit there and exist. They're going to roll down. The background configuration is actually going to change. And it'll end up in a stable value. Okay? So, um, hmm. okay, so, um, well, this thing, eta, is what we call the massive Higgs boson. Whereas the fluctuation in beta is what we call the massless Goldstone boson. All right. So, um, So remember, this set of solutions, the, the entire ring is a set of solutions. This is just picking one particular thing. Because if you think about it, the, the condition of extremizing the potential just led to phi squared equals mu squared over lambda squared. So any assignments of phi 1 and phi 2 that satisfy this are solutions to the equations of motion. Okay? We just picked phi 1 equals mu over lambda and phi 2 equals 0. We could have picked phi 2 equal to mu over lambda. Okay, it doesn't matter. Yes? Did you say uh, phi 1 or delta phi 1? Uh, so, well, I mean, actually, these should point to these. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, Well, now remember our original symmetry was phi goes to e to the i theta x phi. Right, that's the original symmetry. Because phi was complex, we can multiply by a phase. If I take this solution, that clearly has that symmetry. In fact, if I write down this and I do fluctuations about this, the Lagrangian is going to look the same. It's just going to have deltas everywhere. Okay, so it's obviously going to share this symmetry. If I take this as my solution and I do delta fluctuations, or if I do eta fluctuations, beta fluctuations, and a fluctuations, that's just renaming the deltas. Then, is this? going to exhibit that symmetry. What do you think? Well, it doesn't exhibit the symmetry, but is that symmetry part of the theory? In what way? Yeah, but if you're rotating, like, what in this picture is capturing the idea of rotating around this circle. What do you think? The phase, but what in this new picture, this new description is capturing that phase? Beta being masses? It's actually beta. Fluctuations in beta, beta, is exactly moving around the circle. That's the symmetry. So beta, the Goldstone boson, 
is a reflection of the symmetry. Okay. But think about this. Our underlying Lagrangian has a symmetry in this direction. Eta, or sorry, beta. Beta, if I try to consider the existence of a fluctuation in beta, or sorry, beta is the fluctuation, that's not actually physical. This is just a symmetry. Okay? This is a pure symmetry. This, like, I can wiggle beta around, but I can change the value of beta, but there's a symmetry in this. You, it, it's not physical. Betas are physical. A's are physical. Betas are not physical because the underlying Lagrangian has a symmetry that is associated with the motion in beta. Okay? Now that might not be very acceptable, but just hang on. Okay? What we can do, because beta is non-physical, is we can just set it to any value we want. Well, let's just take zero. Okay. This, of course, leaves our theory in terms of eta and a mu, both of which have masses which are not zero. Okay. Now, I'm going to give you some words for how to explain or how to understand this Higgs mechanism. Okay. The Higgs mechanism, which is what we're talking about, gives mass to the gauge fields of a spontaneously broken symmetry. Notice, the symmetry, the underlying symmetry is there. It's this sombrero, thank you very much, Ross. <laughs> it's this sombrero potential. This, this potential obviously has this rotational symmetry. That is obvious and explicitly present if you're doing your perturbations about this solution, but if you do your perturbations around any position in this ring, that symmetry is what we call spontaneously broken. Okay? The theory written in terms of the fluctuations does not share this symmetry. However, there is this beta particle, particle, which encodes the fluctuations along that symmetric circle. So given that those are purely symmetric, we can always set them to whatever value we want. So we can let the beta be zero and only consider fluctuations in the real directions, eta and a, okay? Well, are we really setting beta to zero? I mean, what's happening? Well, remember, Remember when we were counting degrees of freedom with a gauge field, this is spin one, right? And it turns out that if the mass of this field is zero, then it enjoys two polarizations. Okay, two polarization states. So there are basically two degrees of freedom you've got to specify outside of just the motion of the thing. I mean, the motion is the speed of light, but nonetheless, um, it's got these two polarization degrees of freedom. However, if this was massive, it enjoys three polarizations. Okay? So there's something kind of missing in this story because we find that if we take this as our starting point, then A is massless and it's enjoying two polarizations. If we take this as our background solution, A is now massive, but it should have not two but three polarization states. Where is it going to get an extra polarization state? We need a degree of freedom added to this. 
where is it going to come from? Exactly. So this is the language of the story. A eats the Goldstone boson. This is a single degree of freedom. It's a scalar. But A is going to eat it, giving it a total of three degrees of freedom. So that's why, that's another reason why we just want to eliminate the Goldstone boson from this story, because eta is a scalar, but A is a vector, but it's now a massive vector, and it needs these three polarization states. Now, um, what is, uh, of course, you know, hopefully obvious is that this example of the Higgs mechanism, where we start out with a symmetric theory, and we have this unstable equilibrium, and moving away from that unstable equilibrium to a stable point actually breaks the symmetry, but in doing so, it gives mass to the gauge particles, okay? This can be generalized in a way which I will not show you, because it's ugly as hell, to the breaking of SE2 left cross U1 hypercharge down to U1, uh, sorry, hypercharge, down to the U1 of electromagnetism. We won't go through the details of that because it's incredibly ugly. But hopefully, what is obvious is that this is the mechanism that is going to give the three gauge bosons of the SU2 cross U1, that's four gauge bosons, it's going to give three of them mass, and then of course it's going to leave the photon massless. So that's just a more complicated, I mean, this, this is U1 partly because I can draw a U1 potential. <laughs> I can't draw SU2 left cross U1 Y potential. That's, that's too hard, okay? But at any rate, I hope from this sort of cartoon example, you understand how you could apply the same prescription to this symmetry being broken to this symmetry, okay, at the expense of giving masses to some of the bosons. Of course, if this was broken entirely to no symmetry, all of the bosons would have mass. But you do get this residual symmetry. This residual symmetry requires a massless boson. Do you have a question? Yeah. When you say breaking symmetry, is, this, is that the, the essentially perturbations from the equation of motion for the Lagrangian or the? Yeah, the equation for the fluctuations does not share the same symmetry. They do, they do share the symmetry, it's just not in, a, in an obvious form, I should say. So when, so when you say breaking symmetry, that happens where and when? Where and when? Yeah. Um, So, so, well, let me. Let me say this, okay? Suppose that I am at this peak, okay? So I'll just draw the peak here, all right? And I consider fluctuations in the phi one and phi two directions around that peak, okay? Phi one and phi two, it doesn't matter what direction the fluctuation is going, the, the story is going to look exactly the same because this is symmetric in all directions, okay? Versus if I do the same thing here. Here, 
the fluctuation along phi 1 is a massive fluctuation, whereas the fluctuation along phi 2 is a massless fluctuation. So I've lost that symmetry. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell me like the mass equals 0 or doesn't 0? Is there even a capital M or anything? Like that? The capital M. Capital or, M. or the mass, but not yeah. mu. Not okay. mu. Okay, all right, so um, now uh, it gets better, and it gets better. Because remember, in our story about the problem with massive stuff, we observed that if the gauge fields had mass, then the symmetry was broken. Now we understand that you can have a symmetric theory which is spontaneously broken, that's what this means, okay? Um, and by the way, spontaneous, I should, I should say this, spontaneous is a reflection of the fact that if you started out here and you decayed into one of these, there's absolutely no preference for which of these points you, you fall to. The direction you'll actually go is utterly spontaneous. I'll show you another example of that in a minute, okay? So that's why the word spontaneous is used here. There's no specific direction to which you must but once you've decayed and you end up in this state, then you've got a different theory where the symmetry is explicitly broken. Um, that explains how the gauge fields which were massless here become massive, and that resolves that problem with, you know, to have a symmetry, you have to have massless gauge bosons, but we know that the weak bosons are massive, so how does that work? Well, it works by the story, but remember there was another problem we encountered, and that was, the fact that mass terms involve the left and right chiral states of a spinner being combined, okay, but the SU2 left symmetry only acts on this. So we had to take the mass of all particles to be zero as well, all matter particles, okay? Well, guess what? All we have to do is add to this story our massive particles, or sorry, our fermions, so we'll add in Dirac terms in the Lagrangian, and we couple them to the Higgs field. We don't give them a mass term, rather we couple them to the Higgs field, okay? So we might say, you know, the, the, the coupling is phi, chi, left, chi, right, And what we discover is that when phi takes a non-zero background, at the zero value, this is massless, but when this takes the non-zero value, this is going to generate a mass term for these. So all I'm trying to say is that the Higgs mechanism does two things, two incredibly valuable and useful things. It first of all gives gauge bosons mass through the breaking of the symmetry, which is exactly what we expect for the story it also gives all matter their masses. This is why it's often called the God particle, because it is responsible for all of the mass in the universe. Okay? Now, um, there's an interesting question which someone could ask if they felt like it, but I don't think you feel like it. Um, and that is, how do you ever end up there? I mean, don't you have to just live there? I mean, why would you get up there, right? Because after all, I'm arguing that this was the fundamental symmetry a long time ago, but now it's broken to this. So how did that happen, okay? So let me give you an explanation for how that could have happened. Um, and I'm gonna erase this, probably regret it in just a minute, but at any rate. So what we have to bear in mind is that throughout time, the various constants which appear in this Lagrangian, like mu and lambda and so forth, you might think those are constant, like electric charge, right? Electric charge is constant, right? 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 Electric charge, constant, right? 
No, it's not. It's not at all. Okay. <laughs> it's not. I know you think it is, but it's not. Okay. You guys. Anyway, but all constants that appear in a Lagrangian are not constant. They change. Okay? They change through a process called renormalization, and we'll talk about that towards the end of the semester. Okay? But the electric charge is not a constant. I know you think it is. Okay. So um, if the constants in that can change with time, then what we could imagine is a situation where early in the universe, phi looked like this, where that was the stable solution, okay? But then as the universe evolved, I'll just do three. As the universe evolved, this curve, which is just dictated by these parameters, mu and lambda, okay? So, I mean, let's, let's just say, you know, that, that this was zero initially and this was non-zero. Then you'd get a curve like this, but then mu starts growing from zero to some non-trivial value. Then this might actually change. And I'm sorry, I'm not drawing this symmetric, but it should be symmetric, okay? And then at some point in the history of the universe, and once again, the thing has to be there, but later on in the evolution of the universe, it eventually evolves to that point. If at early times it's here, then it's obviously going to settle in that psi equals zero solution. But then if the potential deforms to take this form, while well, you're sitting in this psi equals zero solution, you're obviously going to decay to one of the stable solutions. Yes? If the stable point is at zero, then you can't have mass, or is it? Well, no, no, no. So the, yeah, this, this is going to look different at this time. This, at this time, the background solution will have to be at that point, and it'll be fully symmetric. This will enjoy that symmetry, okay? okay? But it doesn't mean mass has to be zero. zero. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, well, no, 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 the masses are zero. The, the gauge field, everything is, so in this case, this has a U1, I mean, this is a discrete, but we just imagine rotating it around the z-axis. This has the U1 symmetry, and it's good. It's a good symmetry. The gauge fields are massless, all that stuff. This one, the U1 is broken. The gauge fields now have mass. If you are in one of these points and you're fluctuating around those points, okay? I mean, you could try and fluctuate around that, but you'd automatically roll to a minimum. So, so what, I'm, what I'm arguing, and of course these are more simple pictures, is that at this point in the history of the universe, we had a theory which enjoyed this symmetry. This is not this particular potential, but just a cartoon version of it, okay? Early in the universe, we had this potential because the, the, the potential for this symmetric theory looked like this, so we were, we were forced to be living around that spectrum. But then as the universe evolved, the potential, the, the, the constants here, changed their value such that the potential took this form, and at this point, this was no longer a stable equilibrium. So we're forced to one of these, but that corresponds to the U1 leftover symmetry of the electromagnetism, okay? Now, this is, this is time. But um, if you think about it, the history of the universe, it started out small, really small, and ever since it, its origin, it's been expanding. So the energy density has been decreasing. So we can take time to the right, or we can alternatively consider energy to the left. If you want to increase energy, you go back in time. 
So, I, and I, I'm gonna give you an example in just a minute where this will make a lot more sense. It's a very concrete example that you can wrap your head around. But my point is, at high energies, you have the symmetry, and as the energy decreases, the potential form changes to the point where this is no longer stable, you move to here, and you've broken the symmetry. This is how the Higgs story plays out, but I'm about to give you a very physical example of this, which you'll all go, oh yeah, I need that. Go ahead. Um, in the intermediate term, is there any symmetry there? Yeah, there's, there's symmetry here because you're still stuck at that point, and fluctuations around that point are obviously gonna show that symmetry. But it's no longer the SHR will collapse to the No, that, well, I mean, yeah, no, it can be, it can be. What the, the thing is, is the underlying Lagrangian the underlying Lagrangian has this symmetry in both cases. But it's whether you're dealing with the Lagrangian versus the Lagrangian for fluctuations. The Lagrangian for fluctuations does not have the symmetry because the fluctuations are just doing this. They're not sampling both sides. Here though, the fluctuations are sampling both sides. So the fluctuations have the symmetry. Here the fluctuations don't. The underlying Lagrangian shares the symmetry in both cases. Does this make sense? So, uh, once again, this has the symmetry flipping it. This has the symmetry flipping it. That's the potential in the underlying Lagrangian. So if you just write down the equations of motion, they're gonna have these symmetries. But if you consider fluctuations around a solution, these fluctuations are not gonna share the symmetry. These are. But fluctuations are what important, what are important because fluctuations are the particles we observe. So now when we do an observation of particles, they no longer have this symmetry, rather they just have this symmetry, they have electromagnetism. Okay, but let me give you an example of this which is completely in a different context, but it shares this property of a spontaneous transfer, a spontaneous symmetry breaking, and you'll be like, oh yeah, I need that. Okay, suppose, that I gave you a bunch of magnetic dipoles. Okay. And moreover, suppose I gave you a bunch of magnetic dipoles at extremely high temperature. Okay. So if I gave you a collection of magnetic dipoles at extremely high temperature, you can imagine that they are vibrating and wiggling around so much that their orientation is completely random. And I can never draw a totally <laughs> random thing in my life. But anyway, you know, every, it's supposed to be random. <laughs> anyway, so they're totally randomly uh, situated. Now remember, dipoles have this nice interaction. You know, two dipoles like to align with each other. So I would like for you to imagine what happens as I lower the temperature. What happens when I have this system of dipoles at high temperature and then I just turn the temperature down? What will eventually happen? They'll all align? Yes. Because basically this has so much thermal motion that their interaction through, the, through magnetism, their interaction is overwhelmed by their kinetic energy. They're wiggling so bad there's no alignment. But as you take that wiggling out of the story through lowering the temperature, eventually the interaction between them is gonna take over and they're going to align. In fact, they're all going to align two observations. Number one, is there any reason why they align in this direction? Remember, I'm not applying an external magnetic field. This is just, there's no external fields, it's just a collection of dipoles going from hot temperatures to low temperatures. Is this the particular direction they will align? No. What can you tell me about the direction they align? It's spontaneous. It's spontaneous. Same as 
I just forgot my little arrow. But anyway, the same as when you pick which direction you're going to go. So this is spontaneous. But now here's the most interesting question, and I think I'm going to have Connor. You get to answer it. Which case is more symmetric? The high temperature. The high temperature. Why? Exactly. You might look at this and say that's more symmetric than that. No, this is completely rotationally invariant. This, in this case, the SO3 here, three-dimensional rotation invariance, is broken to SO2. That's in the plane which is perpendicular to alignment. This is spontaneous symmetry breaking exactly like what we're encountering here. Okay? So hopefully, look, this is a different set of interactions and so forth, but hopefully the idea that at high temperatures slash high energies, temperature is a measure of energy, at high energies you can have the symmetry, and as you lower the energy or the temperature, that could spontaneously break leaving you with a smaller symmetry. That's exactly what's happening in the Higgs story. Okay? Now, um, yeah, okay. So now um, I'm going to finish with a rather interesting observation. Um, are there any questions about this before I move on? I'm just trying to sort of motivate that this was not a crazy idea when Higgs proposed this. I mean, here's a very you know, well-observed concrete example, and he's just em employing that prescription into particle physics and realizing, wait a minute, if, if I have the symmetry being broken as a gauge symmetry, I get these wonderful mass terms, okay? And that's solving a lot of these outstanding issues. Now, um, the Higgs mechanism, is an example of what we call non-perturbative effects, all right? So um, let me give you a, a, a really cartoonish example of what I mean by non-perturbative. But first and foremost, the fact that the Higgs mechanism is a non-perturbative phenomenon is the main reason why, in order to do particle physics, we really need to work with quantum field theory versus relativistic quantum mechanics, okay? And I mentioned this to you the first day of class. I said we could just try and relativize point particle quantum mechanics. You can do that, okay? But it's got a lot of problems. One is the coefficients in the Feynman diagrams are arbitrary. If you're doing quantum field theory though, the coefficients in the Feynman diagrams are well determined. But moreover, if all you're doing is taking point particles and quantizing them and then relativizing them, particles are per per perturbations. They're small perturbations. They're not big perturbations. The Higgs mechanism employs these non-perturbative effects. So you can't put the Higgs mechanism in the particle-like description. You have to have a field theory. Now, um, here's a very reckless analogy, but it's just one I want to show you. Um, suppose your field is a lake, okay? That's a you know, function that's spread throughout, the, in this case, a two-dimensional thing. Um, then particles are ripples on the lake. Now, the lake is coupled to another surface, and that is the ground, okay? Obviously, and so if I draw a lake, you know, I'll start with the ground that it's sitting on, and then I'll add in my water, okay? And then particle-like fluctuations are just these little ripples in the water, okay? So if I just focus on the ripples, that's perturbative. 
However, I can imagine a non-perturbative configuration of the ground, which is radically going to change the behavior of the ripples. For instance, suppose that instead my ground looked like this. Okay, where now our water, since it's coupled to the ground, does that. It's got a waterfall in it. Now, can you tell me if the behavior of perturbations is going to be exactly the same in this case as in this case? Hell no. This is a non-perturbative effect. This cannot be built out of just studying small fluctuations. It's a change in the background. But it obviously influences the behavior of the particle-like fluctuations. Does that make sense? It's a stupid analogy, but I'm just trying to give you so many analogies that you actually feel kind of comfortable with this idea. Particles are the perturbative fluctuations. These are the particles. However, if you employ a non-perturbative effect in the theory, if you go from this to this, you're going to influence the behavior of those particles. Okay? Well, now I'm going to give you one more. <laughs> But this one's my favorite for reasons which will be obvious. Any questions? Okay, yeah, go for it. So, um, the flat plate is a perturbative um, example, and the couple is not Well, no, 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 that's the thing. So what you do is you take the Lagrangian and you solve it for the background field configurations. And then you expand around those backgrounds in fluctuations, and those fluctuations describe particles. This is just taking one solution, and this is taking a different solution. But they're obviously going to create particles which behave very differently. The fluctuations here are going to fall down a waterfall, <laughs> and they're not going to go up. For, yeah, I mean, that's a really good example. Like, the fluctuations here can move anywhere. However, here, they can't move to the left up the waterfall. They can only move down the waterfall. So you're kind of breaking a symmetry in that. But let me give you another way to think about it, which is by far and above my favorite for reasons which will be obvious in just a moment. Let me encode this story by saying the following. Suppose that I took a bunch of lines. So I drew a bunch of lines. And let's just suppose that these lines were actually right on top of each other. I'm not writing them right on top of each other because that, that's degenerate. Okay. And now suppose that for each of these, I drew a little line that began and ended on one of these or between them. So for example, I might say, okay, I've got a, a thing which does this. I've got a thing which does this, and I've got a thing which does that. So that's a set of possibilities. And then I can imagine going from here to here that way, or I can imagine going from here to here that way. These I don't put arrows on because they, they, they both have their ends on the same line. So I could take this and I could just flip it over. This, this doesn't have an arrow. But these, one begins on this and ends on this. The other one begins on this and ends on this. Okay, so I can also do the same here, and I can do the same here, and then I can do it here. Okay? Now, if I put these lines directly on top of each other, then all of these little stringy thing, I don't know what the hell they're called, but anyway, they would be indis indiscernible from each other. They would all begin and end at the same point. However, they're, they're different because this one starts and ends on this one, this one starts and ends on this one, this one starts and ends on this one. This, you know, they're different, but they would all look the same. Okay? Make sense? So, um,
There are nine of these. I'll just call these string. Okay? If there's nine of them and they're indiscernible from each other, you can imagine that these generate something like U3. You guys know what I'm talking about now, right? What am I talking about? String theory, okay? Turns out in string theory, the black lines are what are called D-brains. D-brains are basically surfaces of dimension P. They're DP brains, they're the Dirichlet brains. But anyway, a D-brain is a surface of dimension P, and it can and cannot include time, it just depends. So there's these hypersurfaces. And what's important about a D-brain in string theory is that open strings, those are the strings that have ends, they have to have their ends on a D-brain. They have to. So in string theory, we have open strings and we have closed strings. Closed strings can be anywhere. Open strings have to begin and end on a D-brain. Well, this is basically taking a stack of three D-brains. And what it turns out is if you study these string-like fluctuations, this is now um, perturbative, the strings are just really small fluctuations, what you'll discover is that the theory that describes them is a U3 invariant theory. Okay? Moreover, these things have masses which are zero. Because it turns out that a string has tension, but if the ends of the string are close enough, the mass goes to zero. Yeah, you might, I mean, tension gives me energy, but then there's a negative contribution from quantizing this, and the total energy, the tension contribution minus the negative quantum contribution ends up giving me mass equals zero as long as the distance between these isn't too large. Okay, that's fine. All right? You'll see where I'm going with this in just a moment. But here's the important thing. When I have D-brains in string theory, the strings which begin and end on the D-brains end up being the gauge fields associated with this description of what's going on. So it turns out if I take D-brains and stack them, I'm always going to get a gauge theory out of it. Okay? Does that make sense? It, it shouldn't make sense, but <laughs> just bear with me, okay? Now, um, the only question I would have is, so again, this is basically a U3 gauge theory if I just think about, so, so, string, so I'll just remind you, strings are basically the underlying structure of particles. So if we could see it close enough up, we'd realize, oh, it's actually not a particle, it's a string. But if you step back, which we have to, <laughs> those strings are going to be like particles. So these are, in the low energy approximation, these are just the particles in a gauge theory, like SU3, like strong interactions, except that we don't have the S there, we just have U3, okay? So the strings in the low energy limit just correspond to particles, so this is a U3 gauge theory in low energy, a low energy field theory actually, okay? But here is the magical part. Suppose that we took our D-brains and we peeled one off. Well, let's draw the results. We've got a String which begins and ends on that, a string which begins and ends on that, a string which begins and ends on that, two strings which go between these, and then we got these bad boys. Now remember what I said about the mass? The mass gets a contribution from the tension, and that's a positive contribution. And then it gets a negative contribution from quantizing it. The negative contribution doesn't change, but now I've stretched these strings. And if I pull this far enough out, these can become massive.
Well, if I think about what the low energy description of this would be, these are now massive, so they cannot generate a symmetry. These can generate a symmetry, and this one can. So this is actually going to break it to U2 cross U1. Because U2 is from these four massless ones, and then the U1 is from that one. Okay? It's pretty cool, right? Now I'll ask you, and this will be the end. In this elegant string theory description of breaking a high energy symmetry or a symmetry in this configuration to a smaller symmetry in this configuration, where is the Higgs? is the distance. This is the Higgs. Notice, in our, in our description of the Higgs mechanism in field theory, I had to introduce a new scalar field with an interaction. I have to couple it to all the shit, and that's going to explain the masses and all that stuff. It's this crazy abstract shit. In string theory, it's this simple. You just pull one off. It breaks the symmetry and gives everything mass. I mean, that's exactly how it plays out in string theory, which is amazingly simple and physically intuitive to me, to be quite honest with you. Okay? But I'll end it there. <laughs> we won't go any further with string theory. Who's putting the math on the board for that? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'll, save you. I'll save you of that. Uh, are there any questions? So just a reminder, your midterm exam is Thursday. It is over all of your homework that you've been done, doing. You can bring in those resources and use them on the exam. It's one question per homework assignment, including the current homework assignment. I gave you one question last Thursday. I'm giving you one more tonight, and I'm giving you the solutions to this homework tomorrow. So you, you can try it, and then you can review the solutions tomorrow. Okay? Cool.